There we are. Hello and welcome to episode two of Creation Tide with myself and with Father Neil Hook and with Reverend Marcus from Langham. It's really great to have you guys with me again today. Thank you for joining me. Uh, today we are going to focus on this week's uh, theme, which is love your neighbor. One of the readings for this Sunday comes from Romans 13 verses 8 to 14. So I thought perhaps we would begin today by reading those verses. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbors. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in correct carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I apologise, that was the NIV version. Probably should have used the NRSV version, shouldn't I? That's okay to use different versions. I think right. that's good. Yep. Hello. Yeah, okay, excellent. I will use a different version another time. <laughs> so, guys, I've got some questions for you today. Um, the first question is What did Paul mean when he said loving one another fulfilled the law? Mm, love it. Have a stab at that one. I think um, well, for, for Paul, although you know, we know he's a Pharisee and well versed in the law, after knowing Christ, he came to realize that the law wasn't the um, sort of preeminent relationship with God that we, that we could have. And actually, he talks about it as being sort of secondary. And for him, faith, you know, was, faith was the primary thing. And he taught, in Galatians, he talks about law as being um, um, a teacher, you know, something that is useful when you're sort of a spiritual child in a way. Uh, but when you grow up, you don't want your teacher by your side all the time. You're you sort of raised up to the point where you can make decisions for, for yourself. And so he wants us to sort of leave that, leave that aside. And when we learn to love others, then actually we don't need the law because everything in the law is summed up in that. Um, uh, because um, it's really, I mean, he's talking about religious laws, I, I'd imagine. But the same sort of applies for, for civic laws, you know, because they're always trying to catch up with where we are. And they're never going to quite make it. But if you love others, you don't need to worry about what the law says because you know you'll be do, doing doing the right thing anyway. So it's, it's, it's something about that, I think, isn't it? Um, the law having its role, but actually uh, what really guides us is love of neighbour, you know, as as um, inspired by it, what we end up seeing. It's Christ. that thing, as Marcus says, between the letter and the spirit of the law. So I think Paul is trying to get to uh, the, the message across that when you strip it all away, love is at the core of the law because all the law is is, is the means by which you enter a, into a relationship with God and so it, love is at the heart of that relationship and I mean Leviticus 19 says love your neighbor as yourself um, and then Christ picks up that of that Old Testament relationship um, and, and and runs with it and teaches about love but incarnates love as well and that's where we have to uh, i think focus on this creation tide it's about incarnation and it's about christ incarnating that love showing that love to all of creation um and i mean james um writes um if you really keep the royal law found in scripture love your neighbor as yourself you are doing right 
Thank you. What does loving our neighbour have to do with creation and creation tide? Don't get me started. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> So give you a time the, problem, the problem that we have is that, that as much as I love scripture, it is a very anthropocentric thing. It's all about the focus between, or not all of it, but most of it is the focus about our relationship with God. Fair enough, because it's, it's, it's given to us. But what it does is it then um narrows our gaze so we end up concentrating about on our relationship with with other humans and not with the wider creation um so we've got this anthropocentrism at the heart of it and paul makes this declaration about loving fellow humans um, but at the heart that word love is agape that's the word that's used there um, and that love is not an emotional love, it's an act of will. Um, it's a deliberate love, it's an active love, it's a self-sacrificing love. And for me, we've done precious little self-sacrificing when it comes to God's creation. Um, and so that's what we're going to need to focus on this, this Sunday, this first Sunday in creation is to focus on that agape love, that active love for all of, of God's creation. And, it, and in the end, you could say you're being self, uh, full of self-interest because if we want generation after generation, our children and our children's children and their children to inherit a world that is not blighted by severe weather and food shortages, and energy brownouts and all sorts of, of massive ecological disasters, then we are going to have to learn to love, to agape God's creation because God's creation and the, the things within it are as much our neighbours as the people that we sit next to in church. Sorry. That was a little bit of a trigger there. <laughs> Went off on one. No, I thought pretty succinct actually. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Um, so we're thinking about you know what, what has loving a neighbour got to do with care, caring for creation, and um, uh, they're so intertwined. You know, and uh, as Neil says, we tended to think in Christianity, isolate ourselves a little bit from the world and think it sort of really is about us uh, more, more more than anything else. But I guess when you look at the scriptures, you rediscover actually there's, there's all sorts of threads that don't put us above, but alongside as well. So yes, we're given in the creation narratives this special role of, of care um, for creation. Um, but, our, but our model there is Christ. He gives himself in sacrifice for it. So it's not one of domination. But when In a Genesis account, so on day six of Genesis, humans and animals are created on the same day and they're both given vegetation to eat there's this sense of real kinship and then in the second of chapter of genesis you've, you've got um um adam created from from dust in a human from humus that real strong um connection there so it's no surprise that when if you, you do something to creation you're also influencing humans and or the reverse if doing something to humanity has an impact on creation and beginning to, to to, to see that and it's really clear you know as neil mentioned in, in things like climate change you know, it's a real sort of social justice issue and so although we might think of it as a, a an environmental concern you know um we in the west we're the ones doing the polluting most of the polluting and uh, but the ones who are suffering it, it's not us so much i mean you know we've got a few storms and a bit of property damage and so on um, but actually the devastation is elsewhere and so, so it's making those links and connections in in your mind you know, who, who is my neighbour? Well, they're the person who lives downstream where all my pollution goes, you know, and I'm not loving them by sort of uh, pushing off my waste onto them. It's not just about that pollution. I mean, Marcus makes a fantastic point because um, we live in a consumer culture here in the UK um, and you go into a high street short store and you can buy a T-shirt for four quid and our neighbours 
have made that in sweatshops in Bangladesh mm -hmm. and in Latin America. Uh, children as young as eight years old forced to work 12, 14 hours a day um, mm -hmm. just to satisfy our need to, to have a, a cheap t-shirt. Um, and if they're not our neighbours, then, then I don't know who is. Um, and that's one of the things that we have to do is we have to really examine uh, ourselves uh, as and, and this consumer culture, this rapacious um, greed that we have um, corporately and individually uh, for things. And, and lockdown hasn't happened, hasn't helped because, um, you know, Amazon and the, the big suppliers have I've never made more profit than they have at the moment. People are bored and they're buying things off the internet. Um, and those things are being made out of plastic and then being discarded or they're being produced in ways that aren't necessarily um, uh, in harmony with, you know, human rights. I, yeah. post, I posted earlier this week on Facebook um, a comment. It was a video by a woman who makes dresses. She makes costumes. Um, and uh, she, uh, a company in China had taken her photographs off of her website um, and had posted a picture of her dress that she'd made that they were going to sell her dress for £50 or 50 whatever it was, mm. a dress that cost her two, uh, over £200 to make. Um, and if she was selling it, would have to sell it somewhere along the lines of £1,500. Um, they, so they'd, they'd taken her pictures and everything. And she said in the, in the YouTube video that was watching that the fashion industry has a carbon footprint that is the same size as the carbon footprint of the United Kingdom, France and Germany combined. It's quite astounding, isn't it? The, and I guess I'm quite a bit unaware of the, of the new way of buying clothes, you know, because I think as a bloke, you know, buying clothes isn't a great pleasure. It's a bit of a chore, so I don't, I don't do it much. And uh, I'm quite pleased to buy something and keep it for as long as possible. But I, it's not... For most people, it's a, it's a question of sort of shift going through stuff, isn't it? Quickly buying stuff. Because it's so cheap, you can use it once or twice. As the father of, of, of a teenage girl and, and a, uh, a young woman in her 20s, I can tell you that, um, yes, you're right. As, as men, we don't necessarily um, view clothes shopping in the same way that they do. <laughs> um, but, um, but, I mean, that's, yeah. just, that's just one example. Um, of the, the way that I liked the way that Marcus talked about upstream downstream, you know, um, we're, we're getting them to push these goods upstream to us and it takes a tremendous effort for them uh, and they get so little return. Um, and, and what we give them back is not fair wages. It's not recognition. It's just this um, effluence from our society exporting our plastics um, into the sea. Yeah, that's it. And our sort of carbon emissions as a gift. Yeah. It's I, interesting. I, um, sorry, Marcus, did you want to oh, say something else? Sorry. Oh, no, I just, I've just been shopping before coming here. I was just in, Mor in Morrison's. And it was quite intriguing on um, milk, which is often shot, sold as a loss leader, isn't it? And they sell it cheap in, in a price that even our farmers can't make anything from it. And but they, it was just they were sort of advertising look 11p from this part of milk goes to goes to the farmer just trying to make people aware you know of, of um uh, you know of um what their purchase achieves or achieves or doesn't i think people just don't just don't know you know i mean i guess some people don't care but i think people don't really don't know the most all the money from what from the products goes to advertising you know sort of traders and middle people and actually those who make it generally get very very little so, you know, I almost think that actually, because we, we're quite familiar with fair trade, aren't we, as, um, uh, as one sort of way of supporting fairly people, you know, generally people overseas. But what would be better, really, would be to do away with fair trade and have unfair trade on everything that wasn't, you know, stamped in the middle. <laughs> you know? Unless you can prove that you're fair, you're going to have this mark um, on, on your food, because that's generally, I think, it seems to me, how, how it works. Mm. I thought it was interesting that we, it's, come on to clothing because my next question for you 
uh, for you both was what does it mean to clothe ourselves in the Lord Jesus? Oh, nice link there, Sophie. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Tenuous link. The radio <laughs> DJ there. <laughs> Grim, don't eat your heart out. Um, when you put on a set of clothes, um, your appearance is changed. There is an element of transformation. And so when we clothe ourselves in the Lord Jesus, there's a transformation occurs from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so that's why we have to put on the Lord Jesus. Um, because in doing so, we trust who he is. Um, and we trust what he's done for us. Um, and it's, it's about clothing ourselves with those character qualities with those virtues that identify us as the children of god and we've got to be careful we've got to be careful that we don't do that superficially that we don't just wear that as a um a, a, as our outward vesture so um really i think we should perhaps uh clothe ourselves with the underwear of the lord jesus something as intimate apparel, um, something that we wear closest to our skin um, and that reminds us um, who we are as the, as the children of God. Um, and one day, that, that actually, we're going to take that off. We're going we're gonna to be divested of these clothes, of this skin, of this body, of, because we'll have a resurrection body the hope of the resurrection lies before us. Putting on the underwear of Christ, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, there's a sermon there, I think, I'll, I'll work on it. And, um, <laughs> I'd like to see that recorded for you, Marcus. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, when you, you write about sort of putting on the, the characteristics of that you, you see in Christ and, and letting that be your, your, your way in life. When you think of um, in terms of environment, there are some things that ways that Christ are, and some of his teachings that apply, I think, pretty directly. And there's that, that wonderful passage where he talks about consider the lilies, you know, they may never spin or weave, but they're clothed in the greater majesty than Solomon, and, and, and so on. And um, he's, he's outlining this, this way of living that's very, um, it's against being acquisitive and, and storing up things for yourself. Um, it's being dependent on God for your basic needs, delighting in what's there around you in, in the natural world, trusting God and not trying to you know, store up treasure and, and, and be rich and wealthy like Solomon, because actually all, all you need has been given you already. So it's, it's almost like a pattern for ecological living about against consumer, being a consumer and a consumerist and sort of, you know, consumption and storing up wealth and so on and all the things you're told you need to do um, to, be, to be human and to be playing your civic duty as a consumer. And so clothing yourself with Christ is a very sort of countercultural thing to do, I think, in that way. You know, and we've got, it, we've got, we've got role models, haven't we, in, in St. Francis or maybe St. St. David to some extent who have, have done that, you know, and, and, and lived it. And also there's, there's another aspect of living in the way that Christ does that I think is quite important. And I think it's in Mark's gospel when he goes into the, Jesus goes into the wilderness before his ministry. And it's only in Mark that it's mentioned that he dwells with the, the wild animals. Um, and there's this sense that when, when you're with Christ, you're at peace with creation. You know, not recommending that we sort of say our prayers and then go and sit in the, in the lion's den and think we'll be okay necessarily. But there's this sense that actually um, part of the Christian life is being at peace with the whole of creation. So that's part of your clothes. You know, you're not, you're not there to despoil or to rule, but to be at peace. And how can you achieve that in, in, in what you're doing? So lo lots of Christian environmental apparel we can put on, I think. Thank you both. Now, I, I did ask you both if you could provide me with some resources and or possibly some ideas for how we might share loving our neighbour um, this for this week. Um, Marcus, are you happy to start? Well, I haven't, I, I've given it some thought and I haven't got many sort of snappy Im images to show you, but I'm thinking, well, what, what can you do? You want to lo love your neighbour. 
And we've got different, we've talked about different ways of doing that. You know, some are sort of more, more direct than others. So buy fair trade, fair trade produce when, when you go shopping, um, because that's a very simple way to do it. You get what you want and, uh, and the producers get what, get what they need. I mean, in a more diffuse way, you know, we think of the, the whole climate issue that's sort of um, bedeviling us at the moment, then um, you, can do, you can do a lot about it. And it does seem a bit, a bit overwhelming at times. And, uh, but one really simple thing you can do as a church or as an individual is just swap to a green energy supplier. You know, it's really easy, really easy these days. And, um, and then you know that you're not, for your electricity use in the house at least, adding to, adding to climate, climate change. So that, that, that's really simple. And thinking about carbon as well. I mean, you might, um, um, you might think about sort of protecting some of the, uh, you know, the rainforest and the sort of tropical forests that are so necessary for biodiversity as well as, you know, carbon, carbon storage and so on around the world. There's a great project in Wales, actually. I, won't, I don't really, can't really see that. You really can't. So um, it, it's called, uh, <laughs> called Size of Wales. You may have heard of it. It's a charity that was set up, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago with the aim of preserving a, an area of rainforest the size of Wales, because Wales is often quoted as we were losing the size of Wales and however many years it was, was associated negatively. Um, so they wanted to turn that around and make it a positive. But they've already preserved an area of rainforest the size of Wales, but they, so they're going for two now. So, um, I mean, that's only one example. I only mention it because it's a local one. But you might think about diverting some of your some of your money, your ch charitable giving, uh, in, in that way to, to, to protect habitats and preserve, you know, livelihoods overseas as well. I've got, it's, anyway, it's I hand over to Neil. It's difficult when, we're, I think, we're called to be uh, advocates. There's an element of advocacy that the church is supposed to have. Um, but as individuals, the sheer size of the problem can be quite overwhelming. So as Marcus says, there are organisations out there Friends of the Earth, um, right down to the National Trust, um, and mm. so many others in between that, that will engage in that advocacy for you. Um, and you can find the environmental organization that fits your particular um, approach, whether it's a local organization, and that's something that you might want to do this week um, in terms of your neighbors. Um, find out what other community groups are in your area um, and how your church can make links with those other community groups. It could be that, that you know, we've got harvest coming up and okay, it's going to be a lockdown harvest, but it could be that there's an allotment association in your area or your community council or your local primary school. Um, how, have a think about how the church can, can uh, work with other people in in that area to become mini advocates in that area and then as Marcus said divert maybe some time and some attention to what's going on a, on a global scale um, in terms of being an advocate for sustainability and then there's always prayer um, I know that um, we've mentioned earlier in this this particular podcast um, about um, environmental factors and things that are going on and obviously coronavirus is front and center for uh, a lot of people um, so particular prayers for Spain as they have a, a new surge uh, for Brazil um, as well as our own country but we've also got to remember because it's kind of overshadowed by coronavirus um, that there's over a million acres of California on fire at the moment um, that uh, just earlier this week there were flash floods in Afghanistan that killed dozens and dozens of people whilst they were sleeping. The Hurricane Laura is supposed to make landfall on the border of Texas and Louisiana so sometime in the next 24 hours. 500,000 people um, are being evacuated. Um, and that there have been flood, there's been flooding locally uh, in our own country of Wales. Um, so when we pray, as we do, as we're called to do um, throughout this week, not just this Sunday, but in our daily prayers, um, we can take that theme of loving your neighbour and maybe incorporate some of the themes that, that from this podcast that, that jumped out at you 
in into your prayers a good thought Neil. and if you're watching this um you might want to um encourage your vicar to to use some of the resources that have been sent around to them all so don't let it languish on your inbox there's lots of creation time and resources that have recently gone around ways of praying incorporating love of creation into into your into your prayers and your confessions and so on and, and to engage engage with that Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of websites as well uh, that I've come across. So there are um, particularly uh, sustainablepreaching.org. There's lots of um, uh, preaching um, notes in there. There's greeningthelectionary.net and of course arosha.org uh, who um, you can get involved with what they do through Eco Church, but also through Wild Christian, which is a more individual thing. Um, Don't be afraid to strike outside of Anglicanism as well. Yeah. You are seeing the Methodist Church has some fantastic resources um, on their websites and other uh, provinces um, mm. of the Anglican Communion as well. I've also found two books um, that might, you might found, find helpful. Um, there is Forest Church by Bruce Stanley and Creative Ideas for Wild Church um, by Mary Jackson and Juno Hollyhock. Um, brilliant name, Juno Hollyhock. What a lovely. wonderful name. Isn't that lovely? Mm. Um, it's Taking All Age Worship and Learning Outdoors. Um, so I will put the links um and names of books etc up at the end of uh this session and on the web page as well on my web page if you can't find it on here uh, just looking just looking in ahead in advance yeah um, one of the reasons that creation season resonates particularly for us in the uk marcus mentioned this in our last uh podcast was because it um it falls alongside harvest festival so maybe this week have a think about what Harvest Festival is going to look like in your parish and in your church. And don't think that just because you're in lockdown and your church may not be open, that you're not going to be able to do Harvest mm. Festival. You just may have to do it in a different way. It may be socially distanced. It may focus this year on food banks um, and supporting the vulnerable in our community. It may focus overseas on some of the areas that we've been talking about. Um, but that's another good thing to do is to just start some planning so that uh, um, harvest doesn't uh, jump out in a fortnight's time in three weeks time and suddenly take you by surprise thanks neil thank you to you both for joining me again today it's been well, brilliant this. Um, Pleasure. It's just wonderful um let's pray before we finish mm. heavenly father thank you for neil and for marcus Thank you for this technology and for the opportunity to come together and talk about the things that matter to us and to you the most. We pray for your creation. We pray that you open our hearts and minds to see what is important to you. And we ask you to bless our churches, bless the people that are working hard to reach out to people during this coronavirus lockdown and bless each and every one of us as we go about our daily tasks in Jesus' name we pray amen amen hey thanks Sophie.